This is me, Undead Viking. One of the cool things of working for Taste of Minstrel Games is that I got a copy of this right away. All right, yeah, so I'm gloating a little bit. Now, I was really excited to play this game. This is from the same designer of Snowdonia, a game that I love. Um, I had looked at the game. I had read the rules. I knew I was going to like it. I had this really good inkling. Now, I realize, yes, I work for Taste of Minstrel Games, and I'm sure, like, there's a few of you that are going, oh, yeah, I suppose the game's awesome. Hmm? Well, you know, the thing is, is that it is. So, uh, but I'm going to let you be the judge of that. I'm going to show you how to play the game. I'm pretty sure uh, if you know the designer and you know this type of game, this kind of like area majority card action game, um, you're going to really love it as well. And then I'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, here we go. Guilds of London! All right, this is Guilds of London. I've gone ahead and set up a four-player game of it. So I'm going to dive in here and teach you how to play. All right, so to begin with, you are going to go ahead and set up the board. You use these two tiles right here. This is the Guild Hall of London. You're going to put four pawns. Each of these, they're called liverymen. Uh, they're basically the people that are going to try to vote you into power uh, in these different guilds. And these guilds are built around here. You always start with the Church of St. Lawrence Jewry uh, right here um, to the right of the Guild Hall of London and then you build it clockwise. Later you'll be adding more tiles that come out of this giant stack over here and I'll explain how that works in just a little bit when we kind of show how the turn structure goes. Uh, over here you're going to place two of these neutral liverymen per player so since I have all four players I'm going to have all eight of them in those locations. Um, I'll explain their purpose also in just a little bit and then you choose, the, this is the plantation tile and it has the plantation of Ulster you can see the written right there and has the plantation of Virginia right there. You can see that the rewards uh, for scoring this particular tile, uh, the plantation for uh, Virginia, and you get seven victory points versus three victory points for first and second place. And on the other side, you can see three victory points for second place. But over here, you get to draw cards. You get to draw these uh, these mayoral reward cards. I love saying that word, mayoral reward cards. Anyway, uh, so you get to pick uh, which side you want to use. I've just gone ahead and picked that one. Um, these are the action cards. Each person can, is going to get six uh, to begin with in the, at the beginning of the game. Uh, you have a max hand size of seven, which is actually delineated right there. It is possible to get that max hand size up to eight if you control um, a certain building. Uh, but, you know, I, I just... There's, there's lots of things like that um, that will kind of break the rules, uh, like as far as certain powers or whatever that uh, having control over different guilds and, and different uh, special buildings like the Church of St. Lawrence Jewry uh, will give you. All right, so uh, after you've gone ahead and set up the game, each person has four deliverymen here. Uh, the rest of the deliverymen are in the general supply. Um, you won't don't really like keep them in front of you. You could if you wanted to, but basically they're either in the general supply or they're out on one of these uh, tiles uh, vying for control. Uh, they're in the main, the, this main tile in the middle, or they're over here in the plantation. So um, it can, they can rarely, uh, due to the effects of some cards and some actions, uh, return to the general supply. For the most part, uh, once you've removed them from the general supply, they are out and they're working for you. So there you go. All right. So action cards are these. I'll explain those in just one quick second. But these mayoral reward cards, just so I can, I'm going to grab a couple of these and just show you what they are. You're going to start with uh, one of these that um, you get a few and then you get to pick one and then you get and then that, that one you have and then you're going to collect more of these as the game goes and, and as you might guess um, these are final scoring cards. So after the whole game is over um, each person will show each one of these cards and if and depend on depending on how well they satisfied uh, what the card is asking for uh, they'll earn some victory, extra victory points at the end of the game. Uh, so, like, and, and I should mention before I step too far, uh, the game does come with two of these uh, excellent reference sheets that detail the different actions for the cards uh, on both sides. Um, the, the special buildings that delineates exactly what uh, the special powers of, of the special buildings are, and it also states um, down here, like if you have a question, like, oh, what does this mean? You can see there's a little letter H there. 
you can go to the mayoral reward cards. You can go to H and it says plus one victory point for each mayoral reward card you have, uh, including this one. And so you can, you know, reference those and then so here you know that's one point for every uh, neutral liveryman you have and this is two points for every master pawn that you have on a compass tile so you know so just things like that as the game progresses you will collect hopefully uh collect a ton of these this is kind of um one of those things where it's like uh the game you could be in second or or third place or even fourth place but if you have man managed to uh collect the right ones of these cards and uh and you have satisfied them uh, out on the board, uh, then you are going to gain a lot of points there at the end, and you can springboard yourself uh, into first place, if, uh, theoretically, possibly, as long as you did it better than the other players. So, there you go. So on your turn, and each person uh, takes in turn order, this is random to begin with, I just plopped them down like so. So it would go red, blue, yellow, green, in this particular one, after um, the first turn and every turn afterwards, um, the order is determined by victory points. And so there's the victory point track over there. So if it was like this after the first turn, the turn order would remain the same. So because red is first, blue, but if like say blue was there, then blue would go first. Now there is one interesting thing. So like, let's say this happened, but then yellow scored points and got on top of red on the same spot you do stack these whatever is on top is the first player like so pretty straight yeah so and, and this is exhibited in other games i played as well and you might have played a game like that but just keep that in mind that whatever person is the last uh to score on those points uh is will go ahead of the other players and then you can stack up all four uh, on the board obviously as well this is important because this is a game where turn order does matter. Uh, going last has a lot of benefits because of the fact that people are going to be placing uh, their liverymen out on these different guilds and trying to get them to vote and trying to get control over them. And you want to have a majority. You want to be able to say, I have you know the most people voting for me and I get to claim this tile. I get to claim the points off that tile. So if you're going last, you then get to see where everybody else places their guys, and then you can react to that and kind of move your people around and either move on to tiles that you want to beat people at as far as the scoring goes, or remove them from tiles so because you're not going to be able to beat the scoring and, and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. All right, so I have uh, this little hand of cards here. You get six to start with, uh, and then each one of these cards has a color, as you can see, and that kind of dictates um, these different colors of these different flags here as well. Uh, so they kind of show that those are the, like, these cards, the colors of the cards kind of have an effect as far as what you can do with these cards to these different guilds. Now, there's one thing you can do with any card. doesn't matter what the card is, no matter what it is. You can just place it down, I'm going to use that card, and that is just to take one of your liverymen that's in the general supply and place it in the main guild hall in the middle of the board. Any card can do that. It doesn't matter what the color is. It doesn't matter anything else that's on the card. You can do that. So you could use all six of your cards to take six liverymen, plop them down into the middle of the guild hall, done. That would be your entire turn, and you'd go on. You probably wouldn't want to do that, but you could use that as that uh, action. The other possibility you have is, depending upon the flag that's up here on all these different cards, you can then play one of those and say, I'm going to play this card to move one of my Livermen out of the main guild hall and onto a tile that has the same flag on it. So, and that will then put that particular uh, liveryman out there. And if they meet the voting criteria for the tile, which I'll explain in just a couple seconds here, they will then theoretically vote for you. They will, obviously. And then you'll hopefully gain control over that tile. Some tiles you can see have two different flags. And some tiles have all four. You can see this is actually like a special building. Special buildings will have four on there. Uh, the University of London and the Church of St. Lawrence Jewry. Um, in... You just ha you don't have to satisfy both of the flags. You just have to have one. So if I wanted to move one of my guys to that particular uh, tile there, which would be the goldsmiths, I could use either one of these crowns or the compass, and either one of those would allow me to move 
my, uh, my, my, my liverymen over into that location. So that is the second possibility of these particular cards. The last thing you can do with these cards is you can take the action that is located on the card itself. Now, this is a game that does, you know, I, I have a few of my friends in my uh, game group that will always say, why don't they just write it out on the card, what it does? And they have to explain to themselves, well, because of the fact that you can just print off all of these cards for all different languages that you're going to print the game for, and you just have the iconography, and then you just have to, you know, redo the rules, and rewrite the rules, and rewrite the sheets in the different languages, and so then you just reference the iconography. So, this is a game where it's going to take a little bit of time to kind of just understand what the icons do and what the icons reference. Um, but like, as I said, you get this really cool reference sheet and you get this in the rules themselves, which uh, the rule book is really well done. I have to admit uh, it, it explains the game very, very well and very completely. Uh, there weren't really any rules questions that we played it. Uh, we were able to dive in after the first game and we played it several times since, and there's just no problems. But anyway, regardless, um, you know, the, the, it'll just take a little bit of time uh, to understand exactly what each one of these cards does. So, like, this is pretty simple. Um, if you take this action, and I should mention before I talk about the actions of the cards, you have to pay a price to do these actions if there is a price up here. So, like, let's say, you know, like this card right here, if you pay two you can take this action, which is just to get four victory points. You can just Now, how do you pay the two? Well, on the back of each one of these action cards, there is a coin. That references the fact that you have to discard other cards. So if I wanted to play this, I would have to discard any two cards, discard two, and then play this card. And what we've done is we just put the card, we, we kind of show the two that we discard, then put the card on top that we've done. And so you can kind of just say, and I'm going to get four victory points for that action for discarding those two cards. So, like, this particular thing is that um, this references the plantation. And so for no act, no cost, you could take this action that would remove, if you had uh, people over on the plantation, you could remove the people from the plantation, return them to the, the guild hall, which is, you can see that symbol, it's right there. And you can remove, and, for each one that you remove, you gain victory points for doing so, if you wanted to do that. That is actually... Now, I should... A couple quick things. Um, just this, these two dots up here means that there's two of these cards in this giant deck of cards that's over here. And then there's a number of the card just for reference as well. Uh, this card, notice there's an X up here. So, depending on how many cards you discard, you can then gain... Uh, like so like let's say you discard two cards, you know, I'm discarding two and I'm gonna play this card So you discarded two cards. So two plus two you can get four of your uh, Liverymen out of the general supply place them into the guild hall if you wish or you can gain neutral liverymen equal to the numbers of discard so then you you kind of determine uh, the price of that particular card and there's also cards that like do things like this, where if you play this, then any sickle card you play is the equivalent of any of these symbols. So I could say, well, I'm going to play this, so then I can play this, and that's now a green card. And so I can take this, and I can place it onto this guild, like so. Like I said, there are tons of these cards located in this deck that have, like, you know, Tons of different special abilities. You're 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 not um, as as you play. You are going to like experience like a, a several different possibilities of actions and what have you. And as always, if you do run out of these cards, and in a four-player game, and as you play, it's very likely that you will because there's different actions that allow you to draw more cards and what have you. Uh, like the Church of St. Lord's Jury, if you, if you, if you uh, control that, uh, you get four victory points and you can draw four cards. There's certain things like that. You will get through this. Just shuffle up the discards and make, make another pile or what have you. So that's what you do. Each person takes their entire turn 
you know, either you know, taking the actions, moving their palm, moving their livery men around the board and placing them. And after everybody has gone, you're going to go into what the resolution phase. Now, during the resolution phase, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be checking each one of these tiles to see that if they have enough uh, of the livery men on there to prompt a vote for control of that guild. Now, I should mention one quick thing here. There's this big, giant, silvery guy, and this is called the Beetle Man. Uh, the Beetle is is an interesting uh, character here. He will travel to whatever tile is uh, got the lowest number on the bottom. So I, I'm not going to pick up one of these tiles, but on the bottom of each, bottom right of each one of these tiles, there is a number like this 56. And so, and as you, as these, the beetle will go to the lowest number one. He counts as a liveryman, to, but he doesn't vote. He will just help prompt the vote. So in this particular case, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but there is a four on the top left corner of this tile, meaning that once there are four liverymen on this tile, that will prompt a vote during the resolution phase. So if there were ah, three liverymen on there like so, that would be enough because the beetle is there. Whenever, when you go into the resolution phase, one quick thing too is that you do resolve them, the top left tile all the way to the right, top left all the way to the right, top left all the way to the right. You will be adding more tiles to the board as the game progresses, but that always occurs. So if you have more tiles up here, it's top left to the right, top left to the right, top left to the right, and so forth. That's important because different actions and different things that will occur on the different tiles will actually force some of these livermen to move around and things like that and put and move the beetle because once the uh, once the tile is resolved, uh, the beetle will move at that point if it is on that tile and go to the, the whatever is the lowest tile at that point. So um, you know, it is important to note that the order that the tile of resolution is, is is actually very important, and you can actually plan that. Especially if you're like once again the last player, you can see how the resolution is going to come out, and you can kind of you know see how people are going to move things around and what have you, and you can chain uh, different actions together. So when you resolve a tile, what happens is, and let me just kind of just pull this off really quickly so I can show you this, is that and that real quick. So when you resolve a tile, what will happen is you will determine who, uh, like, you, you see who the majority is. So in this case, let me just put this down here so we can see it again. So in this case, we had two yellow, a green, and the beetle on there. And this little tile here was, was right there. And that's the second place tile, and I'll explain that in just a second here. But, um, so what happens is that you see who had, who, you, you look who has majority, you, you see that we are going to resolve it, but before we do anything, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a negotiation. Now, what negotiation is, is that each player, in turn order, if they have neutral liverymen, are able to replace their liverymen with a neutral liverymen if they so desire. Now, you might be saying, why would I do that? Well, okay, so let's say, for example, let's say there were three yellows on there and there was no beetle. Actually, no, here. Uh, yeah, let's just take the beetle off there. So let's say that the, the be there was no beetle. So these four on here are prompting this vote. And so now it comes time when it's like, oh, we're going to score this tile. Well, maybe Green really wanted to score this tile. He really wanted this power that's being given. Or because of the fact that because um, at end of end of round, end of game scoring, which I'll explain in just a little bit, is like having tiles next to each other and stuff can be very important. And so, you know, like, he, that's something they wanted as well. If Green had a neutral liverman, he could remove his liverman, return it to the center, and replace it with a neutral one. Now, you can't just take them off here. You have to have them in front of you. You have to have those available to you. And when you place it on there, these don't vote. They're neutral. They're not going to vote for anybody. So this tile, then, would not resolve. There would be no resolution for this situation. So that is what those are for. Okay, so just keep that in mind that whenever you are resolving a tile, you have to go through the negotiation uh, process first. All right, so, so we have, let me just put this guy back on there. So we're going to resolve this tile. So what happens is, is that the first player is going to take two, look at their, what, what do they gain? And so you're going to see like the bonuses. 
are that they can, they're going to get four victory points. They, they're allowed to move one of their tiles, and this little slash means ore. So, and this is called a master pawn, and I'll explain that in just a second here. But So they were, they, they're allowed to move one of their existing liverymen to any other spot on, on, on the board. They don't have to worry about whether or not the, the, uh, the, 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 the tokens or the, the little flags appear the same. They just get to move one. And they can move one of their master pawns or one of the other pawns, if they want, to the plantation. So what they could do then is, you know, they, they resolve this so they could move, yellow can move one of these, maybe they move it down to here. May, you know, and so because, you know, for because they want to be able to try to score on that one later. And they move it down there, and then they take another one of their pawns, they put it over there in the plantation, and now we take this tile and we flip it over, and you can see on the back, it's just gonna kind of show you know, the exact same thing, but you're not going to be able to score this tile anymore. You flip it over, like so, and you put it there like that, and then you leave one of the person who won the, won the vote on that tile, and that means that they are now the master pawn of that particular guild. They could possibly move it off there later, but sometimes like it's like good to have it on there because if you can put um, master tiles next to each other they're worth extra points at the end of the game but also there's other things like you know cards in there like each, each master pawn you have is extra points um you know master pawns on remember that that compass one this is a compass would gain you extra points as well things like that now green was in second place so we move that one back to the middle, middle of the guild hall, to the resolution, and they're going to get this little tile that has second on it. And they're going to get three victory points for their trouble. Also, I, I, I'm going to check this really quick in case I missed it. Yeah, so they also would get this bonus where they get plus one uh, neutral liverymen as well. So second place actually wasn't that bad. They get three victory points for their trouble, and they're going to get one of these pawns that they'll be able to use at a later time. And then you just go ahead and keep this little tile in front of you uh, to show that you've gotten that. But flip it over, you know, because it, you can't score it anymore. When these tiles come out, you randomly draw one of those second place uh, tiles to put on there. And so in some cases, like this one down here, you know, it's like second place is four victory points. That's actually pretty good. You know, and, you know, and, and like first place is actually three victory points. They do get to draw mayoral reward cards for their, for, you know, for winning it. But, you know, that's actually not a bad, bad, uh, bad goal to get for second place. Now, if there is a tie for control of the tile, then nothing happens. You're not going to resolve it. If that tile had three yellow and three green, nothing happens. They won't get it. If there was a situation where somebody ties, here, let's do this. So let's say we have three, and then we have uh, there. So this one is going to score. So red would control it because we've met four, so they're going to gain the bonus that's on the tile for first place. However, second place is between two, and neither of them have control. We're still going to resolve the tile, but nobody's going to get the second place bonus on that particular tile when you resolve it because you're just not going to get it. There is also another way that things can, uh, you can break ties. So let's say this one has only a two. And let's say the next round, we're going we're gonna to resolve this one because there's two uh, tokens, uh, two, two liverymen on there. You're going to say, oh, it's a tie. However, yellow has a master pawn that is orthogonally, orthogonally connected. You know, the, one of the four uh, cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. Because of that, they're able to break this tie and actually take the first place reward. And then red would get the second place reward on that. That is why having master pawns on there, you're kind of giving up a worker. You're not be able to use them because they're kind of just sitting there in the tile. But they're helpful for that case. And then, you know, if we, let me just flip this over really quick. If we flip this and we place... Um, this little guy on there like so at the end of the game for every uh, connection you have orthogonal connection you gain a bonus point for having master pawns orthogonally connected like that and so if you had a cube this you can't control obviously but if you had a cube it'd be worth four points because you'd have one two three and four different orthogonal connections so it's always a good idea if you can um, to put your things together however there is a mayoral reward card that says that if you do if none of your 
uh, guilds are connected. It's worth like eight victory points, something like that. So that might be something you go for as well. Remember that when you get these mayoral reward cards, you keep those hidden. You don't let anybody else know exactly what happens. All right, so the game will continue and the each going, and then depending on the number of players, uh, like at four players, you're gonna last, the game's gonna last 12 rounds. And so you can kind of see that with a little four there. And so when you get to these gray marked locations on the board, uh, you're going to go through what's called uh, a growth phase. So during the growth phase, as you can kind of signify here by these yellow, cir ye uh, yellow gray circles, you're going to add tiles to the game. And so the first time you add a tile, it is going to go in the northerly direction and then go clockwise around from the Guild Hall of London uh, in the middle. Now, the thing is that there's this little compass on here, and you notice the north, and you might not be able to see it, but the north is pointing this way. Why is north pointing this way? Because the rules actually state that, well, it says why not, instead of just pointing north, north, actually, you know, set up the game so whichever way is actually north is north on the board. So north is actually this direction for me, and, and where, where my uh, gaming dojo is here. So we're going to go ahead and place six tiles down because we're playing with four people. You're going to place six tiles down, and you just place six more tiles. So one, two, three, four, five, six, like so. And you go ahead and place all of those tiles down. And then, as you can probably see, that, like, and I'll have to move this if, if we got to the next round, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. And so you'd have a complete uh, square at the end of the game. So, and then, you know, with, with you know, so you'd have, uh, like, it built up all around. You know, because you, you are only going to do it, you're only going to go through the growth three times because of the round 12, even though it is a gray circle, uh, the game is over at that point. And so there you go. That is what you do. And then, as I said before, each one of those will randomly get one of these little circles on... Oops, that one's upside down. One of these, one of these circles as the second place reward for that tile. And there. So, after you, also during the growth phase, you will resolve the plantation tile. So, whenever you have on the plant, so I'm just going to put some over there. So, like, let's say more people were over there. On the plantation tile, you check um, to make sure that there is, um, like, a, a majority on there. In this case, uh, there wouldn't be a majority because you'd have two blue, two green, and one yellow. Nobody would have control over the plantation, and so you couldn't score that. However, let's just go ahead and add another blue. So now we have, have control. We have three uh, blue livermen on there, so they're going to control that plantation tile. And then we have two uh, green livermen, so they're going to get the second place. So the... Uh, this icon says you draw three mayoral reward cards, and you pick one. So let's just see what we get here. So, hmm, one for Liverman, one for Ricard. We already saw these. And then, okay, so, oh, yeah, no connection. This is that no connection one. So none of your people are connected. So let's say maybe we're going to go for that. We take, keep this one, put it face down in front of us, and then we take the other two and we put them underneath in any order we want on the bottom of the deck because you will get through these pretty quickly. So then, because of, you'll notice there's two uh, liverymen on there, we're going to take two of our liverymen, and they return to the Guild Hall of London, because they did their work at the, uh, at the plantation, and then they return. And then green would get three victory points, and there's a one on there, so we're going to take one of those and put them on there, like so. Uh, so there you go. Uh, and then that is what happens on these growth phases in heaven. And you do do the plantation uh, on number 12 as well um, And when you get to the end. And then um, after you get through the whole turn, uh, then you will, uh, I shouldn't say whole turn, after you get through all 12 turns or however long, 12 or 15, depending upon how many players you have, four or three, uh, you will then do your final scoring. As I said, if you have connected uh, uh, guilds that you control, you get a bonus point for that. You also um, will score your mayoral reward cards. Whoever ends up with the most points uh, will win the game at that point. I do remember one thing I forgot to tell you. I apologize. On your turn, 
when you play your cards, there's two things that you can do on your turn as far as like how many cards you're going to get to draw out of this giant deck. If you've played no action cards whatsoever on your turn, you just basically didn't know, you passed, you get to draw four cards from the top of this deck. If you played action cards, you draw two cards off the top of the deck. And the only, I mean, and that may seem weird that like with only like 12 uh, rounds, or turns I should say, um, that it seems weird that like you would just give up an entire turn uh, to draw these, but you have a situation a lot of times where the cards you have just don't connect, they don't have a synergy, they don't have uh, the ability to uh, like you know, work for you at that point. And so um, I several times when I played the game, and several times that I've won when I played the game, I've forgone my turn to draw four more cards to kind of reload, restock, and reset myself so then the next turn I can like put together a really good turn. Now, remember that you do have a maximum card limit of seven. So when you do draw those cards, if you do get more than seven, uh, you have to discard down to seven uh, and then go on. However, if during the resolution phase, something happens where you get to draw more cards, like this guy over here, you get to put those cards into your hand and you don't have to d discard down uh, to seven. You only discard down to seven at the end of your turn. All right, so there you go. That is uh, how you play Guilds of London. Um, it is a very thinky game. It is a very challenging game. It has those wonderful moments that I love in games like this where I go, aha, like I just was smart and I just put together a really good turn. And um, especially, I, I like those moments because they make me feel smart and they make me feel like I'm actually like grokking the game. And also, like when I played this, is that uh, I, I'm doing really well at this game. I've won it several times. Um, the uh, the other the other people in my gaming group, like when it comes to my turn and I have a bunch of cards, they all say, all right, here comes another 20-point turn for Lance. You know, so I actually, uh, yeah, I like that um, I'm, I'm good at this one. All right, so let me talk more about Guilds of London uh, in my uh, final thoughts. Uh, I can't throw this one in the air, basically because I am going to head to the post office as soon as this review is done. I'm going to send this off to Scott Alden at Board Game Geek because this game is going into the board game library for uh, BGG Spring and BGG.com. So as much as I've loved playing you, Guilds of London, I do have to send you away. Hmm. Anyway, so there you go. That was Guilds of London. You should know, have a really good idea of how to play the game at this point. Um, if you don't, and you have any questions, ask away, and I'll be happy to answer those to the best of my ability. All right, so why do I like the game? Well, I already kind of touched on the whole idea is, is that it makes me feel smart. It, like, I have these, like, I was, like, the first time I played the game, I was like, I had like three victory points. I couldn't get anything to work. I was like, just, oh my gosh, I just, why is everybody else just pounding me? I couldn't like figure out anything as far as where the cards were, or how to put them together and everything like that. And then all of a sudden I was staring at the board. I was going last and, the, and I had a turn that just clicked. It was like, just, oh my gosh. It was like, if I play these two, I can move my liverymen to this guild and then it'll score and I'm going to get that guild, and that guild's going to let me go ahead and activate two more liverymen that's going to go ahead and put them over here, and I'm going to score that one, and that's going to go let me move ahead one more guy that's going to go over to this one, and I'm going to activate that one, I'm going to get those three guilds all in one turn, and it was like, bam, I had like a 16-point turn, and the game just was like, whoa, this is perfect, and then after that, I kind of just built on that, I built on that connection, that, 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 like, the, the synergy of the cards and the actions, whatever, and I said in tons of these reviews that I love games that make me feel smart, that make me feel like I'm doing something right. And the thing is, is that while I did lead that game quite a bit, or I was in second place, it didn't really happen. Like, like, like I didn't really, I, I ended up beating everybody by, like, by about 30 points. It didn't really like click is be, it, until I actually I scored all those mayoral reward cards. I love saying that. Uh, so, and I, you know, it was like one of those things where it's like, this one gives me eight, this one gives me six, this one gives me five, this one gives me two, this one gives me eight, this one gives me six. And it was just, you know, I my, my score telescoped out. And I realized that it was just one of those things where um, it's not... You know, this is a this is a game where you're investing your actions. You're investing uh, what you're doing on the board to kind of set yourself up for those last few final rounds. And and the, and it's it's weird. It's like uh, you know you know the games that I've lost, and I have lost a couple of these, is when I knew that like I wasn't like I, I wasn't able to just cash in 
on on the 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 reward cards that I had. Like you know, I had cards that were like for every liveryman that I had on the plantation, um, like was a point, and I just couldn't get anybody over there. I couldn't I couldn't get anybody transplanted to that spot, and when I did. Then I did it foolishly because I, I scored it. And then I had to remove my guys and bring them back. And I was like, no, I'm losing points. They're going back. You know, and I, I you know, so it was like one of these things where, uh, you know, I just, I couldn't get that connection. And I, and I realized now that after I played that game where I did poorly, I think, it's, I think I finished third or fourth, was that I, I, you know, it's one of those games where it's like, you have to adapt your strategy, you have to adapt your tactics as the game is played. And you, you can't, you can't disregard these. You can't disregard these end of game scoring cards. And the thing is, is that what I like is that the more I play this, um, the more I'm going to realize probably what people have when it comes to this. Why isn't that person claiming any guilds that are next to each other? Doesn't, don't they realize that they, oh, now I know why. And see, that opens up other, other possibilities where it's like, Oh, uh, you know, it's like you and another person are, are warring over uh, a guild, and if I move my neutral liveryman in there and I remove my guys, he's going to take control of it, and then he's going to have, like, control of that, and then, like, all of a sudden now I've kind of jammed him where he's got a connected, you know, uh, uh, master pawn with another one. I mean, he could theoretically move that off of there, but, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like now I'm, I'm making them do an action. And the cool thing is is that I, I really dislike games where like you can do nothing on a turn and it's just like pff, i got nothing you know in this game that can happen where it's just like yeah okay i could play this little card move this guy here i could play this little card move this guy here but a lot of times you don't want to move your liverymen to a location where they're just going to get scored you know it's like oh i put a guy there and now somebody else can move three in instead of moving four and they're going to score that so you, you kind of play it close to the vest a little bit and then you you want to make sure that when you do move them out there, like it's for a purpose. You don't want to like let them kind of stagnate and sit out there. I mean, that's when going last actually helps because you can move your pawns out and you don't have to worry about somebody sneaking in behind you and taking over the guild. But it's one of those things where it's like as I've played the game, I've realized that there's these different strategies and whatever that are kind of opening up. And as I realize, you know, what people could be going after and I, when I realize that um, like kind of like the the fact that they actually like list how many like the dots on the on these action cards so that you can kind of guess it's like well hmm do i think he's going to be trying to like move men to the plantation do i think he's going to be like you can like greet and each each type of card has its own kind of like like common commonality action like um green cards have a lot of things where they allow you to draw more cards and things like that so um you know so if you're not getting those green cards you have to adapt your strategy to like you know maybe give up on a turn you know and and draw four more cards and like and the most successful times games i've had are when i've passed uh getting back to the whole giving up a turn yes you give up a turn to do nothing but it's, it's not to do nothing. It's to reload. It's to allow the other players just to kind of maybe show their hand, show the directions that they're going to be going down the river. And then you kind of react to that and, and, and sneak in behind them. Or you have like, you know, seven fresh new cards or eight. If you control the guilds, you get to go to eight. You have those, those cards in your hand. And all of a sudden, then you can put together your big turn. Hopefully, you know, not first. You know, you, maybe there are a couple people ahead of you. So then you can kind of like, you know, jump in and take certain things. And, and and then, you know, just have that another big turn to catapult you forward again. And so, and even when I had to do, when I couldn't play anything and I just drew four cards, I still felt like I was doing something because I was, I was, I was getting more resources that I then could start planning my next turn. And I just, I love the game. It's a lot of fun. It's very challenging. Um, it, it, not a ton of AP, honestly, because of the fact that like, remember the cards can basically do three things, you know, that you, you know, the, and that's it. I mean, that's what you're using to do your actions. Um, the only time I ever had any kind of AP with the game, and I'm just, again, I don't mind somebody taking a long time with the turn. I don't care, yeah, especially in this game, because I use it to plot out my turn. But, uh, you know, is when it's like, okay, it's, it's just kind of trying to determine the, the order in which the cards get played. It's like, so I take this one, and that allows me to move this guy to here. Okay, then I take this one, and that makes red cards anything, you know. So, and then I'm going to play these three cards. Uh, they're red, and I'm going to make them all blue, you know, and things like that. So, and then, like, you kind of tile these things. That's the only time I really felt there was any AP. But, anyway... Regardless, if you're looking for a really, really solid, meaty 
medium heavy game here, um, I really strongly suggest this one. Uh, I mean, it probably shouldn't be the first uh, Euro out of the gate that you uh, spring on somebody, but if you have um, some understanding of like like these icon-driven games, I think you'll really, really enjoy this. And if, and if you enjoy this uh, designer, uh, uh, here, uh, Tony, what do you If you enjoy this designer, um, I think you'll really uh, enjoy this one. This is an excellent game, and uh, um, I'm very, as I said, very, very sad that I have to uh, send this off. Uh, so, yeah, enjoy it, Aldi. Anyway, so there you go. That is Guilds of London. Uh, if you have any questions about the game, we'll be happy to answer those to the best of my ability. Um, as always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. And until next time, this is the Undead Viking telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day. All right, bye-bye.